Seeing this makes me so happy that I actually have emotion in my voice. That's how you know the, how big this is for a player like me. Greetings YouTube, welcome to the Blue Corner, and for the first time in over a year, I finally got to talk about Narukami spoilers. Holy shit, it's been too long, and uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing the same thing that Different Fight did with his Dimension Please stuff, where at the end of the week, I'll be going over all the spoilers that have been revealed for my clan that I adore, and I'll be giving you guys my thoughts on them, trying to break them down, being analytical, and also be unbiased here, because... Even though you guys know that Narukami is my favorite clan in the game, I'm not going to let that cloud my judgment. And if I see a card that I think is shit, I'm going to call it out as such. So, with that being said, let's get into this. We only have three cards to talk about, but they do give me a good idea of what the clan is going to be doing in the standard format. As well as some premium implications. And first off, we have our backup grade 3 in the trial deck, which is called Dur Scrap Dragon on here and Duress Clap Dragon on the wiki. I like this name more because it reminds me of Scrap Dragon, which is a really, really cool Yu-Gi-Oh card, as you can see here. Yeah, Scrap Dragon is pretty cool. So in any case, what does he do? So aside from being an Axel Grade 3, he has the Beer Guard effect of one place, choose one of your opponent's Beer Guards, and move it to an open Beer Guard circle in the same column as that unit, and this gets power plus 5,000 until end of turn. To put it bluntly, this guy either sucks up a unit to the front row or pushes a unit to the back row while also getting power plus 5,000. Now, I do believe that you don't have to actually move something in order to get the 5,000 power. You can just slam him down when he's a 17 attacker. But this is interesting. At first, I was like, what the hell is the point of moving our opponent's rear guards around when we can't kill them, especially when you have to move them to an open circle? If it was move a unit to a unit with another unit, then the other unit would die because of the unit, 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 unit. Yeah, I know. But that was on purpose. My bad. In any case, though, yeah, this guy is more or less Scorpion from Mortal Kombat. And uh, there's like, I actually made an image macro of that floating around. Maybe I'll post it up on the video. Who knows? In any case, though, uh, it's something. It's all, it's going to, I mean, it's ultimately not going to be played. Part of my words here. Uh, but... Yeah, I was, I'm disappointed that we did not get Thunderbreak Dragon in here. That would have been a really cool throwback, but oh well. I do have to point out that this guy's artwork is obscenely good. Like, holy shit, this... They have to have brought in the Dragonborn artists for this one, because this this just does not look like something you see in Vanguard that often. Now, a card that is familiar to longtime Naro players is Thunderstorm Dragoon. He's back. 9k power, 5 shield and the simple rearguard ability of, during your turn, this if your opponent has one or less rearguards in the front row, this unit gets power plus 5,000. So, for the simple matter of your opponent having one or less units in the front row, this guy's a 14 speed stick. So he's already able to hit force vanguards for just enough to force shield out of them. And let's run the numbers here. So if you throw an AK booster behind him, he is 22, I believe? Yeah, yeah, 4 plus 8 is 12, yeah, so he's 22, so even if your opponent is playing Protect, and yeah, if your opponent's playing Protect or Axel, they're, and they're on their grade 3, if they don't have very many things in the front row, you can just slam this guy in a booster down and swing for 22. So that's enough on turn 2 or turn 3 against a Protect clan like Oracle Think Tank that you can power through a defensive trigger just because they have one or less units in the front row, and against Protect... That's not going to be unrealistic because Oracle Think Tank and Angel Feather, do they really call any front row attackers up for the game? Not very frequently. So I think this actually has some potential to go off. And as we're going to see with another card, it's also easy to make it work. But in the context of this single post they have on the Coalition, you can call this guy down and then you call down a Scrap Dragon and push your opponent's rear guard to the back row, denying them an Interceptor for the turn, which actually could come up. And now your Thunderstorm Dragoon is, well, 14,000. You now have a pretty good rush turn for that, as provided you stick a booster behind Thunderstorm Dragoon, you can go rear guard, vanguard, rear guard, and even if they hit a defensive trigger somewhere along that line, you're still doing something, because your first rear guard swings, they either block it and you go down a card, or they take it, they get a trigger, you swing a vanguard, and they still, it's one to pass. If you don't hit a trigger, whatever, you can then swing with your other rear guard and still do something. So, okay, I like this. But 
in the context of what else you can do with this guy, in the premium formats, Dragonic Death Scythe, Dragonic Vanquisher, Sky Howl Dragon, uh, Electro Butcher Dragon, Conquest Dragon, they all make this guy live. Oh my lord. We're going to be talking about some of those cards in a little bit too, by the way. So this won't just be a three card reveal, but just also just some small specs. But in any case, I like this guy. And of these two cards revealed, this is the one I actually can see getting play in the core deck when it drops. It just ultimately depends on what the other grade twos we have will do. Because I'm pretty certain that our grade twos will be, of choice will be Recklessless Dragon, Hammer Knuckle Dragon, and Dragonic Death Scythe. I'm pretty confident those will be the de facto grade 2s that we play in the deck, and then after that you'll have room for Thunderstorm Dragoon. And this guy here, Excess Streak Dragon. So Excess Streak is an 8k grade 2, which admittedly makes him a bad ride if you're going first or second. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just a bad ride in general, because then your opponent's grade 1s can poke at you for 8k and you have to worry about that. However, he does come with a really powerful effect of when placed on Rearguard Circle, you Carnivus 1, Soul Blast 1, choose one of your opponent's rearguards in the front row, and bind it. If you did bind, this unit gets power plus 10,000 until the end of turn. Guys, standard Narakami binds. We bind. We have actual synergy with the premium deck, and we're not caring about the bind zone, though. We're just binding to do things. This is basically what I wanted. Like, the simple condition of keeping your opponent's front row clear is Narukami at its core, but instead of retiring to do that, we're just binding. So really, we're just going back to set 2 Vanquisher, which admittedly wasn't a bad playstyle concept, it's just that at that time, Brawler was just a better deck. And truth be told, that subclan might actually have some prominence again in the premium format because, well, we now have a good beat stick to play in that because brawlers don't really care about too many non-themed units in the deck. It's just really... what is it? I think it's just Big Bang Knuckle Dragon that uses broader counterblasts, but you almost would never use Big Bang Knuckle Dragon's effect. Big Bang Knuckle Turbo and Buster on the other hand and Turbo, that's a different story. But in any case, even then though, would you even play both legions? Uh, well, it that's another discussion in its own right, but I like this. An excess streak here, he pops something and gets big. 18k on turn 2? That's no joke. Like, if your opponent's on their grade 1 AK, this is already hitting for a sweet number. If your opponent's on a grade 2, it's still enough to force a shield out. If your opponent's on a grade 3, it's still enough to force a shield out because... 18 means that Force cannot 5k it, they have to 10k it, so that's a good thing. Throw this guy on an Axel Circle when you're doing this, and now your opponent needs to use a heal to block this, otherwise, yeah, their 15 shield is not enough. And, as we see here with our other card, Mr. Scrap Dragon, if your opponent has an annoying rear guard in the back row, like a Laurel, and they have an open front row circle, you can use him to pull that guy up and then kill it with Streak Dragon. Another thing about Street Dragon that is something that cannot be understated is that he gets around cannot be retired effects like, what is it, Sea Stamp Otter, I believe its name is. A certain, I think there's one Royal Paladin unit that also can't be killed by effects, and most notably, Promised Otter. Now admittedly, OTT is seeing a decline in play in Japan, and already starting to see, I think, a small drop off in play over here, but by the time the set comes out, I think OTT has an actually decent chance of being knocked down to low tier 1. It depends on what their trial deck does and their course of support does as well, but the important thing is though, they can't simply throw down Promised Daughter without thinking in swing and not worry about it being popped, because Narus can pop it. They don't care about her can't be retired, you just bind it. Simple as that. And the fact that we are binding means that the some of our really good cards, such as Voltage, VMAX, the Buster, they are more playable now in the premium deck because we have early game binding. I also got to point out that this is the first time ever that Naros actually have cards that are not tied to a subclan, Limit Break, or Generation Break, or Thunder Strike in order to activate. You just throw these guys down and they do something. Like, Narukami without some form of restrictions is a concept that is entirely alien to me. And, like, anyone who's played this deck since its beginning 
would actually notice this too. It's like, huh, you're right. All the grade threes have had some kind of restriction on them that prevents you from just using them. Well, we're going to soon get grade threes that don't have to worry about anything in the sword. You just get to use them when you can. And it's going to be really surreal. So now that we have at least a rough idea of what Naras are going to be doing, which is playing like set two Vanquisher, except not probably not caring about your opponent's binds all that much. Admittedly, this kind of playstyle is going to only help Gear Chronicle do its thing, and we might just have to accept that matchup as an L. On the flip side, though, if we do have something that does care about number of cards in Bind Zone, then maybe new uh, Gear Chronicle plays into us. It could go either way. We'll ultimately see what our boss cards do. I do now believe, though, that Dectonics Drill is going to be some form of board wipe or front row wipe. I just don't know if he's going to be on place or as an act. If it's an on-place, then that actually, well, that helps the premium deck out much better because you can on-place, wipe your opponent's board, immediately stride in the Conquest Dragon, and smash face because guess what gets better in premium format? That's right, our good old friend here, God, uh, God Dragon himself, if I can just find the bugger on here. And he is being stubborn. I sh probably should have just eliminated grade threes from here. There we are. Our Conquering Supreme Dragon, Conquest Dragon. There's very few, few of these on the market. That's unfortunate. No, we don't. Whoa, 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 whoa. God damn, I hate this seller so much. Where? You guys know who I'm talking about. Good old Conquest Dragon here. I think of all the strides you can pick up for this deck in the premium format, this is probably the best one to go with because his, sim his, effect, his effect is so simple. You just flip, kill something, and buff your front row by the amount of open record circles in your front row. Generally speaking, Conquest will give you at most 10,000 power, which these days might not seem that impressive, but if you throw an Axel Circle on top of that, you're now having four attackers at plus 10,000 power. One of them is actually plus 20,000 power. And if you're able to do this against an Axel deck, then they have like one or two Axel gifts on the board, then your front row gets plus 15 or plus 20,000 power. Imagine if you will, you're playing against Great Nature, they commit to the board, they try and kill you, they don't, and then you ride Dectonics, nuke their board, and then go into Conquest Dragon and buff your front row by 20k. That could honestly just break them. That's assuming, of course, you've managed to survive their combos, but that's the thing, though. We have, like, really sweet cards for this format, like Impede Dragon? Oh my lord, this guy. He's gonna get good again. Impede Dragon was one of the best G-Guardians that... I've ever seen for his free kill and his ability to trigger defensive effects such as Vanquish's Generator Break 2 and Sweet Command's Limit Break and that's also a card that I'd highly consider looking into is good old Sweet Command Dragon. People are like going on this whole Eradicator Kool-Aid which is definitely not what I would recommend. Like the actual Eradicator Descendant deck is not good in any shape or form like it wasn't good in set 9 format it wasn't good in set 12 format what would honestly make it any better now we don't have confirmation of dragonic descendant in this new set so his superior ride isn't going to do anything sweet command dragon here has proved himself to be quite decent in these kind of formats because of his limit break being able to pop off being able to kill your opponent's attackers in tandem with uh sky guardian mp dragon that can actually break some combo decks, like NLK Assassin, for instance. What does that deck do? It swings, calls out multiple assassins, and then sucks them back up after attack. So what can you do? You use Impede to kill one of them, and then Sweet Command triggers and kills another one. Your opponent will be left with a minimum of two assassins, and then that means they can't really keep that thing going. So Sweet Command could actually beat one of the more dominant decks of the format, NLK Assassin. I think it also do that to Luard to some extent, assuming they don't call their resist attackers to the front row. Yeah. I, I don't know about that one, but... Like, this has potential. So, those cards aside, I'd also recommend your more obvious ones, like the Vanquisher Strides, the Set 9 and Set 12 G-Guardians, Closer Dragon, because that Generation Break 8 is going to be bonkers with Axel Circles. Um, I don't... Maybe Drachma? I'm personally not going to pick it up because that card is still way too expensive for me to justify it. And Dragonic Descendant Sigma, Shatara, Smashbox or Dragon, you know, the cards that certain shitty Narukami players actually think are, pair, are terrible, when in fact 
they've been some of the best cards we ever had. Like, would you believe me if a certain someone on the wikis and in some discords actually thinks that Shatra is a terrible card? You guys probably know who I'm talking about too, but don't worry. Unlike that Narakana player, I actually know what the fuck I'm talking about. So, you, you can expect more of these videos of me giving my thoughts and being quite reasonable with my arguments too. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. The TLDR regarding all these cards is, I like what they're doing. I am cautiously optimistic about what they're going to do for standard Narakami. And, well, just as an Axel deck in general. It looks like Narakami might be able to do... One of the two things that an Axel deck is able is needs to overcome in order to not suck, which is either build advantage or hit really big numbers to overcome your opponent hitting defensive numbers. Because when you think about why Axel decks are generally bad, what is it that they do badly? Hit for numbers and build advantage. Many Axel decks, particularly the earlier ones, get stonewalled by your opponent flipping one simple defensive trigger or they go so neg in overall advantage that if you just kill their shit off they can't recover and they eventually die out. Murakumo has been the exception to this because they're able to build some advantage and they're able to hit for some numbers. They don't do one exceedingly well but they do, but they do both just enough that the deck is able to actually function which is why alongside Zambaku it's actually competitive in the format. Tachikaze when it doesn't brick is able to get advantage and get some numbers, but that deck is so inconsistent that it ultimately fell out of favor as shown by its lack of any presence in tournaments. So that's pretty much it. Again, cautiously optimistic. I like what they're doing. The premium locations are also looking quite nice. Butcher Road might actually do this proper, but I'm still holding my breath until the actual set drops. Either way though, I'll see you guys next week when we finally get Great Composer Dragons effect revealed and I have a much better idea of what this clan is going to do. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, this is Blue Star 9 jacking out.